Welcome back to the channel, everyone. This is probably the third background you've seen in probably three days on this channel, but that's because we've been taking this show on the road literally. And that's just showing the dedication and reciprocating the appreciation that has been given to me on this channel. Right now, I'm traveling with family for Thanksgiving. And I also want to say happy Thanksgiving to those who do celebrate the holiday. For those who don't, it's time to talk about some very good football. We got three football games tomorrow. And I kind of want to open this thing up and talk about the Detroit Lions. I have one question for each team who's playing tomorrow. And my question that I have for the Detroit Lions is, can the pass rush make a reappearance? Or not really a reappearance, but can the pass rush showcase something that they've needed to show us all season? And that's being dominated against certain teams. When you get into the playoffs, this is something I've been talking about. With the trade deadline, going against a Philly, going against a Dallas, going against a San Fran. You're going to need those defensive linemen who can stymie the run game and also get after the quarterback. And some of these big time games, it's really huge to now we say, OK, we go skill for skill. We got a Amara St. Brown, got a Jameson Williams, but we're looking in those trenches. Panay Sewell. Now we want to match that with some of those other guys. San Francisco 49ers, they have Trent Williams. We got Aiden Hudson. And when they when they defer with that, now who can you go to? Can you go to a Charles Harris? Can you go to a Julian O'Quara? Looking at those types of guys on the defensive line. And I have a couple of numbers that I want to talk about because I think coming off of last game, having Jared Goff with the three interceptions, having Craig Reynolds with the fumble, I don't think I have offensive questions for this team particularly. The biggest thing I'd say is that just cleaning it up. I talked about Ben Johnson a little bit in the game plan that he has. And I think you come out here against a Green Bay Packers defense and a defensive coordinator and Joe Barry, I think that Ben Johnson will put the team in the best position to win. But like I said, Jared Goff, those running backs in the backfield, even the receivers and tight ends, we're going to have to take care of the football if we want to win a football game like this. Now, going to last game, the Detroit Lions had two sacks on Justin Fields. And what I said about the Chicago Bears, their entire passing game with Luke Getze, especially early on, was basically predicated off getting on the move. We talk about those sprint outs. We talk about those RPOs, those play action boots, those types of things, getting Justin Fields' athleticism into space. Now we're putting Ada Hutchinson, our best pass rusher, we're putting him in a bind. And then those other guys, Aline McNeil. We're going to talk about some of the stats, particularly from getting after the quarterback for this team. But... When you talk about the matchup with the Green Bay Packers, the Detroit Lions had five sacks the last time they met the Green Bay Packers. I think we all saw that game it was a game where the Detroit Lions started off dominating the game early. It wasn't really close at all. It was a game that was on Thursday night football. And you're like, why am I watching this? But then things started to come. You had a big time connection down the football field with Jordan Love. And then they crept back into the football game just a little bit. But the Detroit Lions still held them off. And getting into that pass rush, I started to look at Aaron Glenn a little bit. I talked about with Brian Branch. And when you have a guy like that, sometimes what I've been seeing with some of these nickel players, I pointed to Kyle Hamilton in Baltimore. Yes, he can cover and cover for days. Yes, he can also fill the lane with run gaps. But I want to blitz this guy a little bit to help with my pass rush. And I think we've been seeing that just a little more. But when I look at the sacks, Aiden Hudson and Lee McNeil, shout out to Lee McNeil. He's been having a great season. But those two guys account for 43% of the team's 23 sacks. And then we talk about other games. You have six sacks against the Las Vegas, against the Las Vegas Raiders. So I'm thinking about that. I'm coming back to it. Baltimore, Seattle, some of these other games where we don't get after the quarterback as much. And those are the games where you really want to get after the quarterback. So that's my first question. Just recreating the pass rush, reinvigorating it a little bit, and also trying to do some creative things. I don't think the Detroit Lions from a personnel aspect have one-on-one -on -one go getters. When we talk about outside of Aiden Hudson, I think Aline McNeil, he's a guy who can win one-on-one -on, -one on the interior. But when I talk about the collective unit, I don't think there's that much guys who can just go get it at the snap of a finger. Now, we talk about the conversion. That's the flip side for the Green Bay Packers. My question with this team is Jordan Love really the future of Green Bay? And when I when I see some things talking about Jordan Love, I think that he's shown us some good flashes. He's shown us some very good performances. He's shown us some very bad performances, putting the football in harm's way. But the biggest thing that I point to this guy is kind of a rookie. Yes, he saw big time action. Yes, he played in the game last year against Philly when Aaron Rodgers went down. But when I talk about right now, this is a guy who's still going to have some rookie lumps. And I don't think people want to see that. When he sat behind Aaron Rodgers for the duration of time that he did, you bring him into the system. Now, this is a team who's used to good quarterback play. You go from Brett Favre, then you go to Aaron Rodgers. Jordan Love is supposed to pick up where those two guys left off. And I think it's still a maturation process. It's still going to be some lumps in the road. I'm not saying Jordan 
Jordan Love's going to be the future franchise quarterback. But I'm still not also saying that he's not going to be the future franchise quarterback. And I think really coming off of last week, he eclipsed 300 yards. Those are some good things that we're seeing from him. And I want to dive a little bit more into the numbers. 27 of 40 on a day, had two touchdowns. And we talk about his totality of stats in the season. 2,331 yards, 16 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. Now, it's nothing that's going to blow your mind away, but I think we still say, okay, especially with what he's up against. He's had some injuries amongst the offensive line. He's had some of his weapons out. Christian Watson, a guy who we say going to last year, especially with Aaron Rodgers in the back half of that season, getting a better connection. But now I think we come into it. Christian Watson, he hasn't played all games. He's been dealing with the injury a little on and off. Now, he hasn't been the most productive guy on the team this season. Talking about some of the other receivers. And then I think when we really point to the rest of his receiving core, you talk about a Jaden Reed. You talk about a Don Tavian Wicks, a Luke Musgrave, a Romeo Dobbs. And I think that although these guys have a plethora of talent, they're still very young. Even with Matt LaFleur, some of the things we have saw this season, it just hasn't looked like an offensive unit who's really ready to go. So I point to some of those things and I say, okay, I'm still waiting a little bit with Jordan Love. I've seen good football. I've seen bad football. I've seen football in the middle, but I still got to see some things in this game. And I think that also you haven't had a running game that can really assist you. What's the best thing for a young rookie quarterback? He's not really a rookie this year, but we talk about a young quarterback in his first season as a starter with Jordan Love. A.J. Dillon hasn't been the running back that we've seen in past years. Aaron Jones, he won't be there for this game tomorrow. So these are some of the things I look at and no Packers receiver is over 500 yards on the season. When I pair all of these things together and I talk about Jordan Love, I still think we have the big time question. Is he that guy for this? season i talked about christian watson a little earlier but on the season he has 16 receptions 257 yards and two touchdowns that's nothing like what we saw last year out of this guy that especially caught on and he started catching heat in the back half of the season like i said so we still want to see some things and i think you have the perfect matchup against the detroit lions that can show you are you really that guy? Are you really what we're envisioning? Can you be the future for our team at the quarterback position? Now I want to get into the next thing. And this is with the Washington Commanders and the Dallas Cowboys. Will this be the Ron Rivera dagger? Now, like I said, I never advocate for anyone losing their job, anyone getting fired. But I think this is just what's been talked about. This is what we've been looking at. And some of the things when you struggle the way you've been struggling with the Washington Commanders, I want to give you a couple of numbers for these guys. In four years, Ron Rivera is 26 and 34 with one playoff appearance in a season where the team went seven and nine and they lost to Tampa Bay in the wild card. He's never had a winning season in his Washington tenure. His best record with the Washington Commanders was an eight, eight and one season. This is where they tied one game. And we talk about some of the defensive ranks this season, last in points allowed in the entire NFL. How can we have a defensive minded head coach and be last in the entire NFL in points allowed? That's just something that can't add up. That's something that we can't can't have, especially when you have Eric B. Enemy. He's the offensive coordinator. We talk about a lot of teams. We're seeing it now. I think that the movement that we're really seeing across the league is when you get these good defensive coordinators, you can hold on to them a bit longer. But when you get a good offensive coordinator, we've seen some good things out of this offense with Eric B. Enemy, and it's just a matter of time before. Is he going to get a head coaching job? Is he going to be the head coach for the Washington Commanders? What are we going to do with Ron Rivera? And I think when you have these defensive minds, what we've saw is they have longevity as coordinators. How many people, especially when you get these young quarterbacks, when you get these new regimes and you just really turn over, you turn over everything. How many times are we going to bring in a defensive minded guy unless he's one of the best motivators in the game, unless he's one of the best leaders in the game? It's rare that you see the Bill Belichick's, the Brandon Staley's, and even the Brandon Staley. That experiment hasn't gone as planned for L.A. So I think now what we're going to see, how can we do this with Ron Rivera, especially when we're playing the way we're playing? Because I talked about it. They're ranked last in points allowed in the entire NFL, but they're 29th in yards allowed. They're 30th in pass defense. They're 21st in run defense. So what is their defensive identity? And they don't take away the football at a high level either. And I think you trade away a Chase Young. You trade away a Montez Sweat. Now I'm looking at your top 10 in sacks. That's eventually going to drop off a little bit when you're trade two guys like that so i think even with sam howell leading the nfl currently and passing yards out of everybody even a guy like this in his second year leading the nfl and passing yards that's something that you really have to give your hats off to but overall I think there's still a lot of questions with this football team, and they play the Dallas Cowboys. The Dallas Cowboys, they're known for beating up on teams who are struggling and have some things going on. I talk about Carolina. I talk about the New York Giants, some teams who we've seen struggling. They like to pile on those football teams. So 
I want to know what you guys think about that one. I think it's a pretty interesting one. How long would the Washington Commanders hold on to Ron Rivera going against the Dallas Cowboys? Now, we got to talk about the Dallas Cowboys as well because I think that when I look at this team, there's a couple things I like to point to. But defensively, I think I like what I saw so far. Offensively, I think that I see Dak Prescott playing better. He realistically can be in the MVP conversation. The way that CeeDee Lamb is playing has more receiving yards than a guy like A.J. Brown. Being the guy, the number one, and yes, I've said it, I've had this discussion on many different videos. Although he comes out of the slot for a lot of his work and a lot of his receptions, I still look at him, at, I still look at him as a guy who you can run the offense through, and that's what I define as a number one receiver. But even with the offense playing like it's playing, even with the defense playing like it's playing, I still have one major question about one of their playmakers, and that's Tony Pollard. Can Tony Pollard finally gain steam? Because like I said, when you go against a Detroit, when you go against a Philly again, when you go against a San Francisco, this is a guy who you're going to have to lean on. Mike McCarthy, when you when you fire a guy like Kellen Moore, you send him over to L.A., now he's with that team, and you think about, okay, why did we fire a guy like this? And Mike McCarthy talked about a physical brand of football, running the football more, using his defense and catering to what Dan Quinn has on that side of the ball. Now we're going to run the clock. We're going to get this time of possession. We're going to take away the football, and we're just going to really pound on teams. But we haven't really seen that brand of football out of the Dallas Cowboys. I think we've seen more high scoring. It's hard for me to tell the difference of what Kellen Moore's offense looked like to what Mike McCarthy's offense is looking like. And I think that when you have that, what is the point of really firing him? Is it really a scapegoat situation? And when I talk about Tony Pollard on a season has 147 carries, 590 yards and three touchdowns, not terrible stats at all. But I think, like I said, when you go against the NFC's elite, when you get into big time playoff games, how much can we trust Dak Prescott? And this is not a knock on Dak Prescott because he's been playing good this season. But you see it when they go against the San Francisco 49ers, you struggle in a game like that. If you have a Tony Pollard to lean on in a run game, along with Rico Dotto as well. But I think it all starts with TP in the backfield. Number 20, he hasn't eclipsed over 70 yards since week three. That's something you can't have. Has 70 yards versus the New York Giants, 72 yards versus the New York Jets and 122 yards versus Arizona. Hasn't gotten close to that mark yet. So. I think the biggest thing that I want to point to is him coming off of that leg injury. And we say, OK, this is a guy who's still trying to get healthy. He's still trying to shake back. Now, I've dealt with injuries, especially in the game of football. And it seems as if when you come back, you feel like you're yourself. And then you have that wear and tear start to build. Now you say, OK, I felt like myself. But now the way that I'm feeling now, my stamina isn't the same. My wear and tear isn't the same. And probably in those first three games, he felt like himself a little bit. But as the season went on and it went on and it went on, he probably started to, break, to tear down just a little bit. Now, that's hypothetical. I just want to see because they have the offensive line. They have the passing game to complement this. So I want to see getting more efficient in the run game. Currently, they rank 12th in rush offense. They're a top five passing offense. But I think, like I said, the narrative with Tony Pollard is that he's trying to get healthier to really get going in the back half of the season. And I still want to see it. I think this is a prime game against the Washington Commanders, a team who struggles to stop the run. We have to get over 100 yards tomorrow. If you're looking at it from the Dallas Cowboys perspective, I just don't see how you go into a game and you don't try to do that. Now, of course, their secondary is weak as well. But the biggest thing I'll point to and something I want to see is Tony Pollard getting going in the backfield for the Dallas Cowboys. Now, let's get to the final game of the day. And that's the 49ers and the Seattle Seahawks, a very interesting matchup. And I think for the San Francisco 49ers, when you lose a Trent Williams, you have a Christian McCaffrey dealing with the injury. You have a Debo Samuel dealing with the injury. This is no excuse at all. But I think we had to give this for the context of what I'm about to say. The way they struggled in that three-game losing streak and the way they uncharacteristically turned over the football, the way they struggled defensively, thinking what I have saw against a Jacksonville, against a Tampa Bay. Right now, as I sit here today and record this video, I don't have major questions or concerns for the San Francisco 49ers. I think the only thing some people will say is, Brock Purdy when you go against a Philadelphia and we're going to see that in a couple of weeks so this is something we'll be we'll have the pleasure to see when you go against a Dallas in the playoffs when you go against a Detroit Lions 
are you capable of being the guy who throws 250 plus, who gets up in the 300 numbers with a George Kittle, with a Brandon Ayu, a McCaffrey, a Debo Samuel? And I think that's one thing we could say, but it's not something that I want to spend too much time on. Really with concerns or questions for this team, I think two things I pointed out in a video that I dropped two days ago. I talked about penalties and I talked about red zone efficiency. Defensively, they've been playing better, but they have a big time injury and that's Tyler Noah Hufunga tearing his ACL. Jair Brown, the rookie safety. It's going to be huge for him because this is a team that likes to come out in a lot of nickel sets. They rarely run a true base, but they can. D. Winters, another linebacker out of TCU. We're going to be paying attention to how do you transition and how do you adjust losing a guy like Hufunga because he adds in the run game and he has range as a safety in the passing game. He can be the single high safety. He can be the two high safety. So I think when you lose some of that, now we got to lean on a rookie. Will that really matter and how big will that affect us? We're going to see some of that in this game. But that's really my only question I have for this team. So I want to get over to the Seattle Seahawks because I think I have a bigger question for those guys. And the question for me is, how will the Seahawks fare off in such a competitive late schedule stretch of games? I think that when we look at the teams they're going to play, and I want to give you some of these teams. They play the 49ers twice. They play the Philadelphia Eagles. They play the Dallas Cowboys. These are all teams amongst the NFC elite. And then you just lost to the LA Rams. So now they have the tiebreaker over you. I think it's an outside shot. You're really going to have to lose a ton of these games for the LA Rams to even make the playoffs. But it is a possibility. One thing we have to pay attention to. And how can they because they have the talent. This is something I've been talking about with the Seattle Seahawks. I did a film breakdown on their offensive unit, and I think it's extremely important when we talk about it. They have a plethora of talent. You look at the offensive unit, you have a Zach Charbonnet. Now, Kenneth Walker will be out for this game. He suffered an injury last game, but you look at a DK Metcalf, you look at a JSN, you look at a Will Disley, Tyler Lockett, some of the guys, even Geno Smith under the center honing in the troops. I think you have all of this talent, but you just don't have an identity. And I want to give you a couple of numbers to back these things up because some of the statistics, they're 13th in passing offense, they're 25th in running offense, 19th in rushing defense, and 21st in pass defense. So you look at this team and say, what do they lean their Howard hats on when they have to go get something? And this is offensively or defensively. What do they do and how do they beat teams with all of this talent? A Bobby Wagner, a Jordan Brooks, some of these guys on the defensive side of the ball. You look at a boy, Moffe, a Tariq Woolen, a Devon Witherspoon. And I think you have all of the talent, but are we? do we have to look at some of the coordinators in this situation? Or do we have to look at some of the players? Because why can't we put it together as an equal unit? Why can't we be a good team? Now, they currently sit at 6-4, and four, not a terrible record by any stretch of imagination, but... I talk about it when you play some of these good teams and it just came off of the loss that you had to the Baltimore Ravens. You lost a close nip tuck ball game to the Cincinnati Bengals. And I think this will be another occurrence in a situation. Can you beat this team? This is the team you played in the wild card round of the playoffs last year and you lost that football game. So I think it's going to be important to see how do they match up with the talent. It's not saying that the San Francisco 49ers, yes, they got an all-star team, but you look at the Seattle Seahawks, they got some guys of their own and I aforementioned all of those guys. And I think you draft a set, you draft a Zach Charbonnet, you draft running backs and back to back drafts in the second round. Why is our run game not top 10? Now, I think Abraham Lucas, he's questionable. That's your second year tackle who was very good alongside Charles Cross. And that's huge when we talk about the running game and especially the passing game. But even if he doesn't play, I want to see a team assert themselves physically, be, have a have an identity when you go out on the football field because last year I saw a team that can run the football. I saw a team that thrived off of play action and I saw a team that thrived off of deep shots, getting the football down the football field of DK Metcalf, hitting Tyler Lockett on those deep shots. And you add in the JSN, you would think that it would be a little bit easier, but it hasn't gone as planned like that. And even on the defensive side of the ball, I think you're losing a chin and a woe suit. That's something that you talk about with the physicality. Now you brought in a Leonard Williams and this was a guy who was supposed to help. Because you like your skill matchups, and I think I even like the skill matchups for the Seattle Seahawks against the NFC's elite, but you add Leonard Williams, that adds physicality, that adds versatility. When we get in those third downs, he can kick inside. On those first downs, he can be the four to the five tech. So I thought that was the envisionment for a guy like Pete Carroll with that defensive scheme. But it's still early. The trade deadline just passed a couple weeks ago. We still have to see the returns on that trade, but right now we haven't seen it. Like I said, they don't have a they don't have an identity defensively or offensively. So I have to see something like that in this game and I think the biggest thing that I want to talk about really outside of the scheme and outside of the players we talk about coaching and discipline some of the coordinators against the Los Angeles Rams the Seattle Seahawks had 12 penalties for 130 yards 
something you can never have in the game of football. When you talk about a close game like they had, you lose by one point to the Los Angeles Rams, a game you had no business losing. You started off hard in the football game. Everything was pointing to the Seattle Seahawks winning this game, and they lost it. I don't want to see 12 penalties for 130 yards on the football field against San Francisco tomorrow because you thought you lost by one point against that team. You're going to lose by two touchdowns and more against San Francisco. Now, I'm not saying this from the mindset that they can't beat San Francisco. I think Seattle has all of the talent in the world, but when you go against these teams and you beat yourself, it's going to make it hard to overcome all of that. So like I said, I think this will be a very good football game. It's a division matchup, so we know it'll be a little tighter. And you also have something to play for. Seattle hasn't really had any success when we talk about lately going against the San Francisco 49ers. And I talk about that wild card game. San Francisco put it on them. Brock Purdy, Nick Bosa, all of those guys, Fred Warner defensively. So this is something we're going to have to see. And now, This is really wrapping it up, talking about all these games. Like I said, this show is on the road, different background that you've probably seen, probably the third one, like I said, in the past week. But I wanted to get this video out to you guys. I think we have some very good topics. And I also want to know, what do you think about these Thanksgiving games? We got three of them. So it's some big time football. If my mom tells me the mac and cheese is done, I'm going to say I'm recording a video. I'm going to say I'm talking to my subscribers, my supporters. We got to have some talks about some good football because we're going to see it all tomorrow. That's going to do it for today's video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe but that's gonna do it for today and now